Hello, and a very warm welcome, dear friends, to a brand new, quite thrilling episode of Simply Electric, featuring the highly innovative Volvo EX30 as a single motor model with an extended range option for enthusiasts. Extended range signifies having an even larger battery capacity, 69 kilowatts gross, 64 kilowatt net, including rear wheel drive. And today we'd like to hit the highway with you to see what it consumes at 100, 120, 140, 160 kilometer h. We are testing the charging process from 10 to 80% and are very eager to examine the travel comfort and the overall performance of the Volvo EX30 on our track with you. If you're not yet familiar with the Volvo X30, we've also prepared a review with a traditional driving report for you. The link is in the video description, but now please double check if you're part of the Drive Electric community. If not, we'd be delighted if you'd support us with a subscription, and then you won't miss out on the latest videos in the future. We begin with the exploration of the consumption path for the Volvo EX30 RWD ER extended range model. We've set off and are aiming to take you straight to the A20 highway in order to then accurately measure the values at 100, 120, 140, 160 kilometers h as well. On our way there, we're driving through Neubrandenburg and I'd like to measure a typical urban traffic consumption. Stefan, I'm resetting the EX30 counter to enhance urban efficiency, sustainability, aiming to better performance, meet environmental goals, extend lifespan, promote greenery, demonstrate commitment to lower emissions and foster responsible energy use. Driven at the rear here, yes, starting conditions are exactly 13 degrees. We've got all season tires on this one, 245 is what I saw. In 19 inches with factory alloy wheels. Looks sleek, expect more in our video later. And yes, we've actually gone ahead and set the air conditioning to a comfortable 21 degrees in this room. So that's indeed what we consider to be our standard room climate here. And otherwise, we are quite hopeful and genuinely believe this car performs exceptionally well. You'll later see the comparisons in the consumption charts as well. On one hand, to the performance variant with all-wheel drive and 428 HP with two electric motors, but also to all other tested electric cars here on this channel. Do you then also have a very, very accurate and detailed comparison from the consumption table? Is it efficient? Is it not efficient? Where are its strengths? Where are its weaknesses exactly? Here you'll basically learn everything about its efficiency. We drove through the scenic New Brandenburg town and have found the very first significant value for you there. 7.3 kilometers, 13.1 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers are now comfortably situated within the city limits, featuring an average speed of 41.7 kph. That's a decent figure, right? True. I guess probably in the height of summer at 20, 25 degrees, maybe another kilowatt hour could be shaved off. Then, there are a few of your esteemed eco-experts with a really gentle and careful throttle who probably could manage to squeeze out just another kilowatt hour or so. So I believe you could even push it through the city on 10 kilowatt hours, right? Yes, if you don't engage in every traffic light race. Yes, definitely. Indeed, driving with 200 kilowatts or 272 horsepower is thrilling. Heading on the A20 towards Stralsund, engaging cruise control showcases technology's brilliance, maintaining 100 km h. This fusion of power and ease exemplifies modern engineering delivering a controlled yet exhilarating experience. I'm resetting the onboard computer now, and over the next roughly 20 kilometers, we want to calculate the consumption at an average speed of 100 km h on the speedometer with you using this onboard computer. I'm quite curious to see how it performs here. We're currently at 13 degrees now, sunshine, and yes, let's patiently wait and see what will actually emerge from it. We've got the very first reported consumption value in our hands now. I'm totally excited. We've driven 24 kilometers. The onboard computer's average speed is 97.5 km h. So we've been driving a steady 100 km h on the speedometer, 17.9 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Stefan, could you explain what's happening with the twin engine's fuel consumption rates in Hamburg, please? 19.1 at 9 degrees. This means that we effectively save approximately 1.2 kilowatt hours for every 100 kilometers driven, thereby clearly showcasing the WLTP consumption difference between them. So, it's likely that Volvo manages to achieve good consumption values even with all-wheel drive, right? Seems so, yes. We'll verify that at 120 as well. I have right here set the adaptive cruise control to 120 kilometer h, and I'm resetting the consumption counter alongside you guys. And now, let's take a closer look and see. What do we actually get over the next, say, good 20 kilometers at an average speed of precisely 120 kilometers h? Let's discuss the assistance systems on the highway in more detail. We've got an advanced steering assistant on board here. We have an innovative lane keeping assistant installed, and we also have a very efficient and reliable lane change assistant integrated right here. Of course, cleverly, I forgot to activate it while driving. 
before it starts because you somehow can't adjust it while driving. Find it somewhat disappointing, Volvo, that one has to be stationary to tick this box. And if you, just like I do, unfortunately forgot, it then simply does not work at all while you're driving. I fail to grasp the reasoning as to why it's not possible to do this while you are driving, but perhaps you might know. Feel free to kindly drop it in the comments section. Otherwise, as we're used to, he enjoys ringing and booming because he always checks through sophisticated facial recognition and eye tracking if I'm actually paying close attention, if I'm looking attentively at the display, if I'm looking at Stefan into the camera. So he's very active in that regard, always trying to really keep us here to divert our attention because they are, after all, semi-autonomous systems. On the highway, I think it maintains its position very, very well to the center of the lane. It's significantly better compared to traveling overland. In the review we conducted with Fabric, it was evident that I didn't quite enjoy that experience at all. However, what's also missing on the highway, sadly, is the advanced predictive control. That means, if there is a speed limit introduced because of a daytime construction site, or even a section with significantly reduced speed, then we absolutely have to manually adjust the speed via the controls located on the steering wheel. It does not automatically retrieve the driving speed from the traffic sign recognition system and implement it, since it can't do that well, of course, nor look ahead. Those are actually the two requests that I have for Volvo. Please, Volvo, provide the X30 and all subsequent vehicles with the same technology that we know from Volkswagen, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, the one that works well. Predictive, meaning forward-looking. We already know through the navigation data. We also know through the traffic sign recognition in advance what the speed limit is. That means we can drive at the prescribed speed limit as soon as we see the sign, or if that's not possible, at least when the speed limit is recognized through traffic sign recognition, through the camera, then the adjustment in the system accordingly. Because we all desire to move in accordance with the road traffic regulations, and of course, predictive rules would certainly be a dream. We have the next consumption value. We drove 23 kilometers at 120 km h, average speed 116.9, average consumption 23.8 kilowatt hours. That's a bit more than the twin motor, right? Yes. We were at 22.2. Yes, of course, some people might indeed write again, maybe we are facing a crosswind, maybe we are dealing with a headwind, perhaps the course isn't perfectly topographically balanced. So first off, we invariably ride the same, or in most cases, almost the exact same course in our usual consumption paths, so that would naturally even out for all participants, regardless. And reality, in fact, remains exactly the same. So you also drive the Volvo X30 with a tailwind, a crosswind, or a headwind, regardless of the condition. So, these are just real-world consumption figures from the onboard computer, not lab values. But that's actually what you want, otherwise, the WLTP values would suffice. So sometimes I really don't get some voices among you who then look for something, or essentially nitpick about why the consumption is high, low, average, good or bad. Drop a comment on how you see it, because for us it's also a good benchmark to see if you... We can only aim to drive on the very same highway under relatively similar weather conditions to then give you an updated overview in the consumption table. How else were we supposed to do it? We rapidly stopped and have activated the lane change assistant for you right here. We're eager to try that out later in the video to see how it functions. We've set it at 140 km h for now, but that won't work with the adaptive cruise control because it only functions up to 130 km h. Volvo, what's going on there? So it means I can now, for the next 20 kilometers, having reset the trip computer, try to maintain 140 with my deer-like light touch on the accelerator here continuously. Well, I'm curious to see if I'll manage. Keep your fingers crossed for me. But you do stick to the speed limit up to 130, right, Stefan? Yes, for a car that goes 180, it's a bit underwhelming. For an electric vehicle in the year 2024, I truly believe, aside from possessing good navigation with thorough rest planning, there must also be detailed and efficient charging planning included. You're always a bit divided on this, aren't you? Is it necessary? Isn't it necessary? Anyway, I think it's important that nowadays you can also control many things through voice. And we're eager to attempt that by saying, hey Google, could you take us to Munich's Viktualienmarkt, please? Your current location, the Viktualienmarkt in the heart of Munich, is merely about six short minutes away by foot. Route runs through Munich's environmental zone. He does that very, very well. It's really exceptionally fast. This means we now have not just achieved complete route planning, but also the corresponding detailed route planning, including comprehensive charging planning, is thoroughly done. 
Where you can also take complete control of the fine adjustments, for instance, where you can pre-select your preferred charging card providers or even adjust the desired charging speed itself. So all of this I find with Volvo here and the Google Automotive system is really up to date, works smoothly and is truly enjoyable and has become one of the best car systems for me, right? Absolutely. I also prefer to use Google Maps when driving. I'm sorry, I have to dwell a bit on the adaptive cruise control. A, that it can't even go up to 140 km h. And B, as I've already mentioned in the review with the driving report, with this central vertical display. First of all, it's incredibly difficult, even when employing the one-pedal driving technique, to even here, especially under those circumstances, to maintain 140 km h. We'll turn off the one-pedal drive now to see if that makes things easier. Yes, somewhat, because we are constantly fluctuating between 139, 143 back and forth. That means, in the end, you naturally get a consumption value shown here somewhere, which is just what it is. Volvo, what I find absolutely the worst is it's already hard enough. For someone who's used to always dealing with the distancing rule schedule format, spoiled only child. To then, of course, drive up to 100 miles per hour, that's challenging enough as it is. But when I also, like a diligent citizen, only look straight ahead so it doesn't beep and bang, because if I were to look into the camera at you, it would also start beeping and banging quite fast because he's monitoring me through the cameras. So I have to keep looking this way. So I have to check for you guys. Am I driving 140? Am I driving 138? Am I driving 141? It's even worse than at the grind. What also triggers me is the traffic sign recognition. There was not a 100 sign anywhere to be seen. We have actually passed it by now while exiting. That's precisely where the speed limit would be clearly repeated for those currently driving on the highway. Who's always showing 100 here? I don't know either. It's truly unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, I really don't want to keep bashing the car here, but those are just absolutely essential, non-negotiable things to me in this situation. We've also observed that particular phenomenon happening with the American electric car manufacturer too. So if by chance I happen to have a sophisticated traffic detection system, it should, without a single doubt, effectively work 99.9% .9 of the time. What's the use of a traffic sign recognition system where some value comes out that might not even be accurate, that it could potentially face significant issues with empty lanes and then subsequently encounter speed challenges when you're exiting the highway, making errors since you're only permitted to drive at a speed of 60 or 80 on the exit and lanes. There is, for example, the Rostock intersection. I do forgive it for that. We're meant to stay alert. It's designed to aid us, not just to replace our attention entirely. Driving incorrectly for 19 kilometers passing six exits without seeing signage raises doubts about traffic control. This missing safety markers prompts questions on the effectiveness and accuracy of safety and road management protocols aimed at ensuring compliance, what it should. Let's move on to the interesting stuff. Drove 20.1 kilometers, average speed 137.1 kilometer h. I really gave it my all. Average consumption 27.2 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometer. Stefan, what do you think? That is notably better than our results with the twin engine configuration, where we managed to reach a speed of 32.6 kilometer h. Oh, yes, we were a bit over that. So you mean like wind or tailwind? Although we've been mostly going straight. Right? Yeah, on the highway it always feels like we're going straight, doesn't it? We have just made a U-turn and are now heading straight down south on the A20 highway, moving towards Berlin. I've hit 160 km h here. We've reset the onboard computer and we're going to measure the consumption over the next 20 kilometers at an average speed of 160 km h. Yeah, as soon as we hit the highway, he spots a traffic sign that doesn't exist and displays 120 again. Folks, seriously, not even one single sign was to be seen anywhere. How in the world does this complex system manage to achieve such an incredible speed? That would certainly turn out to be a complete mystery, right? I cannot make sense of it either, too. The sound system is truly great. Beautiful, rich sound above all. Initially, I truly believed with this particular sound bar placed right in front of the windshield. It might sound just exactly like at our home, you know? But it also has Voxelin, a subwoofer, and Harman Tadon really makes it awesome here, right? That sounds mega epic. So, I must say, that alone is a reason to go for the blues setup, just to have this awesome sound system. 
because it also has a truly nice and deep bass and everything, maintains beautiful lows, provides a very nice mid-range, and it hums really quite nicely and smoothly. So, by the way, shout out to Jens, our new DJ and hip hopper. He knows exactly who's watching, who I'm talking about. You are free to go ahead and play your techno beats on it. Is it that period again? Yeah. So we've now got a new consumption figure to discuss. Indeed, 156 kmh is the average speed. 21.2 kilometers and the consumption surprisingly hit 42.9. 43 kilowatts for every 100 kilometers traveled. Did he actually surpass that 40 mark once again? Yes, he did. But maybe it's also partly due to the underlying structure because as it happens, we have got this relatively small, quite compact electric SUV right over here with us. Yes, you can also notice it inside here, the distinct wind noise. Not just a flat flounder. I would say, let's show you the values in comparison to the twin engine performance, where we unfortunately don't have a 160 kmh value, and of course also to all the other subjects tested in the consumption tables. I've recharged it. Yes, indeed, it really wasn't much farther at all. 184 kilometer h, the top speed's marked at 180, still maintains 120 despite, you know, feeling like we've passed about 10 exits already where there's no signs. It's, with all the necessary respect, quite a peculiar system, and it somewhat dims the overall reliability a bit, making it slightly harder to fully trust. But what you do notice, he's swaying all the time. Exactly. Now here comes 120. Let's go sharp into it. There's no one behind us after all. It has good brakes. We've nicely hit 120 and now we're slowing down to 100 kmh because as always we're sticking to the rules. And now strangely enough it seems to be accurately displaying the speeds correctly as well. Yes, we can move forward to discussing the aircraft's landing gear next. In fact it's quite quite stiff indeed, more than you might expect. Meaning you can truly feel every single bump, every distinct ridge is very, very stiff, without a doubt. As we, I believe, last experienced with the Tesla Model 3, it too was very sporty, very stiffly tuned. You'll feel it around here, but it's not uncomfortable. It's actually rather sporty. And perhaps it is in the true spirit of the ingenious inventor behind the Volvo EX30, aiming to create a truly beautiful, exceptionally high-performance compact automobile right here. This is what it looks like when someone doesn't adhere to the speed limit. The colleague from Poland is directly right in front of us, yes indeed. And we are accelerating straight away from 100 to 130, 140, 150 quite swiftly. We're feeling the 200 kilolas of the rear wheel drive, 272 horsepower, 343 nimba, 170, 180. It loses a bit of its punch at the high end, doesn't it? Yeah, well it ends at some point, right? So. 0 to 100 is really awesome. Yes, yeah, Stefan timed it precisely with a stopwatch. Got exactly 6 seconds. Factory spec is 5.3. But at the top, it's got plenty of power. Just not as uh, expressive or impactful as clearly at the lower end. But I think that's the case with all electric cars now, right? Yes, unless you happen to have something quite special, like a Hyundai Ioniq 5N. I've actually heard, and it has certainly been shown quite convincingly, it can really push up to something like 260. Yeah, that really must be quite a lot of fun too. So, if you somehow managed to miss the video, definitely go check it out again, because the folks at Hyundai have truly brought some kind of incredible beast to the track this time around. We have now arrived at the Ionity charging station located at the Demonoland rest area, with a battery at a 10% state of charge remaining. It has begun to accumulate a charging capacity of approximately 60 kilo dollars. And precisely as it was with the enhanced performance variant, it initially starts with 60 kilo dollars, a point at which you might possibly think, oh, what exactly is occurring at this very moment? And then it really ramps up significantly, as you might have seen in another video, and of course we're earnestly hoping it does just the same here. And then, surprisingly, it charges from 10 to 80% in just 28 minutes. Yes, many of you often ask me, hey Ollie, how exactly do you manage to charge those electric cars with all those extensive tests you conduct? And there I have... Yes, always a recommendation for you, and that's in charge. And charge is a website or an app where you have the opportunity to collect free miles through affiliate links on your online purchases. And these free miles can be loaded into your car for free at the participating charging stations, such as at Ionity, 
when used in conjunction with a charging card. We've already been able to charge over 33,000 kilometers for free thanks to this. If that sounds interesting to you, feel free to check it out in the video description. I've placed a link to Incharge for you there. And as announced, it's around 2 minutes, 155, 156 kilo lot of. It goes all in, way up. We've already recharged 2.5 kilowatt hours. That is precisely what we require, a very nice charging speed. And it's not always just about what's stated at the counter saying I can handle 250 or 350 kilowatt of, but rather about a very nice high and stable charging plateau. Consistently remember the Audi e-tron, which back then almost continuously charged at 150 kilowatt hours and thus charged a large battery in half an hour already three, four, five, six years ago. That is precisely where the manufacturers need to aim to get to, not always advertising the maximum charging capacity they can achieve, but rather focusing specifically on highlighting how quickly they can charge a device from 10 to 80% with a very high charging peak. 157 kilowatts, we're practically breaking all records, aren't we, Stefan? Always. I honestly do not really know what exactly was our top maximum speed with the twin motor performance setup again. Yes, definitely charged for five minutes, added a good 10 kilowatt hours. 26% state of charge, and of course, we'll keep a close eye on how long it maintains this high charging performance. While it is charging, we are also perfectly able to give you an additional great look at the vehicle from the front side. Volvo, in my humble opinion, has come up with a quite modern, fresh design here that's carefully built on the exact same platform as the Smart Hashtag 1, the Smart Hashtag 3, and also the innovative Secret X. We've got the mighty Thor's hammer right here, or as I fondly and lovingly call it, the Tomahawk. We've got LED headlights that can also brighten and dim. We have air curtains that then, of course, channel the air as efficiently as possible. To effectively steer the wheels, we have utilized two premium, high-quality 4545R19 all-season tires on this specific vehicle model. No, actually, these are winter wheels, Pilot Alpine 5. Sorry, my mistake. They aren't all-season tires. They are indeed winter wheels. Usually, we always get all-season tires from Volvo. I've also had good winter tires on my personal car before. Michelin is always nice to have on board. Yes, indeed, a very lovely medium grey metallic, I do believe. How was it? Warp grey metallic, that is the colour exactly. And if you go for the plus variant and not the standard, then you'll get a nice black metallic painted roof. I think it's quite good, this two-toned effect. Beautiful black trim, black exterior mirror. It looks quite chic and performant. The colour really reminds me somewhat of the distinct alpine grey of Mercedes-Benz, actually. Yes, the taillight design is indeed nice, I think, and it also nicely starts right here in the C-pillar, blending seamlessly. X30 is also mentioned here in the C-pillar, for those who don't know which car it is. And I just love this, these small illuminated details where Volvo has beautifully immortalized itself. So, this is, in my honest opinion, really stylish. It has a rear spoiler and no shark fin. So, Volvo really manages to integrate the technology into the bodywork, the side mirrors, and the windows. The only thing we're still questioning is whether it's the shell car wash's fault for not using enough heat, the rear spoiler's design, or Volvo's engineering for the back window not getting completely clean. Feel free to drop a comment on what you think might be the reason behind this, and you all are always experts. Yes, if you go for the plus equipment package, which is like the mid-range option our subject has, then you also get the electric tailgate with the button located right here. Stefan showed me that nicely in the review during the test drive as well. And there you have a trunk capacity of 318 litres, which can be expanded to over 900 litres of loading volume by folding down the rear seats in a 40 to 60 split or completely. Beneath this floor, there's a double loading floor where you can stash away even more stuff. And in the front, under the hood, so to speak, although here it's not really a hood since it's a purely rear wheel drive variant. So under the front hood, we actually have a small frunk where even a Type 2 charging cable fits which opens electronically, closes electronically. And for all of those individuals who find this standard offering not to be enough, you can either load up a roof rack with a full 75 kilos on the Volvo or opt for the optional tow hitch feature. It comes with a towing capacity. For the standard rear wheel drive variant with the standard battery, it's a ton. And for the large battery with all wheel drive, even 1.6 tons of towing capacity. Well, it's indeed quite substantial for such a compact SUV. You can very easily tow a hefty horse trailer, a sizable boat, or even a spacious caravan, right? Exactly. Off to Holland. Um, 50% after 12 minutes, a good 26 kilowatt hours recharge. It's still charging at 101 kilowatt. 
Yes, that's always the case. Then from 30, 35, 40 percent, the charging curve progressively decreases, and this will probably also change somewhat downwards over time. Of course, we're happy when we can bring you the manufacturer's specifications, or even better, demonstrate them in a practical test, because our aim is always to highlight the vehicle's positive aspects. We're not really success journalists looking to speak ill of anything at all. We simply aim to show you how it truly is without any bias. After 23 minutes, we've got 70% state of charge, a good 40 kilowatt hours recharged, and now it's fluctuating here with 67, 68 kilowatts. I expect a bit more from the future somehow, because especially towards the end, you can really ramp up the speed significantly. Of course, one really has to carefully consider the proportionality, how much I might damage my battery by subjecting it to significantly higher charging peaks at higher charge levels. But in the end, we all really want one thing, we're attempting to narrow this gap between combustion engine cars at the gas station and electric cars. Just so more people perhaps won't have this excuse anymore, saying they're always stuck at the charging station having to charge. An 80% state of charge has been reached, 29 minutes elapsed, and precisely 47.3 kilowatt hours have been recharged. Now it's fiddling around here with 38 kilowatt. Yes, missed the factory specification by a minute. We'll let that slide because the charging station doesn't always precisely stop the time when it starts charging. Instead, most of the time, the clock is already ticking before it finally connects with the car. I'm not trying to sugarcoat this, but that's the experience we often have at charging stations. I'm hitting stop because it's under 50 kilowatts, Stefan. I'm ending this now immediately. Immediately, we departed from the Demeterland rest stop, made our way back to our beloved hometown, Neustrelitz, and promptly accelerated the car to an impressive speed of 130 km h. We're going to reset the fuel economy gauge with you folks here today because we are about to drive a significant distance of 60 kilometers towards Neustrelitz. Part of it via the highway, part of it through country roads, through New Brandenburg, passing through the villages. We might just manage to pull off a rather nice, impressively final third mix for all of you guys, where we get the chance to experience all three essential components. Speaking of experiencing, we likewise aim to thoroughly explore the lane change assist, which we still owe you. We've initiated the system. You can see very, very clearly here how the car autonomously navigates and operates shifted lanes to then carefully attempt to strategically overtake the slower moving vehicle directly in front of us. One must keep their hands on the steering wheel, of course. He certainly has to notice that. Otherwise, he would abort the lane change. So one must be very attentive. This is a somewhat autonomous assistant, and it seems to function on the highway up to speeds of 130 km h. We are going to attempt this once more executing a lane change towards the right, where it fundamentally recognizes that situation now, identifies and acknowledges, yes, but somehow. It truly isn't quite as seamless or smooth now as it once was. Now he took the right lane. Let's try again to the left. We don't have any traffic after all. He executes that neatly once again. Now we find ourselves in the left lane. I'm not sure why there's that red sign. We should consider making a lane change to the right now. We're taking the wheel too? Yes, well, I don't quite get this display. Do you, Stefan? No, not really. Because our hands are on the wheel, right? And that might be a minor point of criticism here regarding the steering wheel. Our models lack capacitive control, enhancing interaction by detecting attentiveness through pressure from three fingers on the wheel, boosting responsiveness and safety. Typical in premium brands, this innovation merges into the driving experience, helping drivers remain focused while engaging more with the vehicle. Here you still have this slight push and pull motion it needs, so it essentially knows that you indeed have your hands on the wheel. Now it's been cut off once again, so somehow the lane change assist feature, particularly when I proceed to compare it to say Kia, or very notably Mercedes, it just somehow feels not quite as smooth or seamless just yet somehow. But that's not a big deal, it's a fresh car, it's a modern car. This issue can be fixed through the implementation of software updates or if I've indeed made a user error, which as I've heard happens from time to time, then of course I genuinely want to extend my apologies to each and every one of you. So it might have been a user error, right Stefan? Absolutely. We've successfully finished the initial part of our third interesting mixture covering a substantial distance of 30 kilometers at an impressively high average speed of 78.9 MMF while consuming exactly 31.8 kilowatt hours for every 100 kilometers. Yes, and of course you've managed to rub off on my dear cameraman Stefan a bit, who's now constantly wondering, do we have headwind? Do we not have headwind? Are we going uphill? Are we going downhill? So where I ask myself, 
yes, what are we going to do? So, do we leave the electric car parked or do we drive it, say we're going from Hamburg to Munich? We first drive 600 kilometers to Munich, then another 600 kilometers back to Hamburg, and then we divide it by two to find the consumption. What? Well, we want consumption values that reflect real usage. We get into a car, right? And then we drive 20 kilometers at 100, then we have a result. Whether it's 12 degrees, whether it's 25 degrees, we can compare all of that together. Whether it rained, whether it snowed, whether the sun was shining, whether it was uphill, downhill, if we're not somehow driving steeply uphill the whole time. But we will never discover a route that is entirely topographically balanced if we're somehow journeying from point A to point B, no matter how hard we try. That's the logic. So we're driving to Munich from Hamburg, then naturally there's a topographic difference since Hamburg is more level than Munich. And when we drive back, we're actually descending most of the time even though we pass through the castle mountains or wherever, through the uplands, and yet we're essentially going downhill again. We always have ups and downs, different temperatures, different weather. No one simply parks their car for just a wind force of five. No, but I think it's really great that people are having the discussion, pointing out these issues. I think that's totally fine too. And of course, you can't compare consumption values at zero degrees to 25 degrees directly because an electric car operates under different conditions than perhaps potentially a combustion engine or even under more extreme conditions. That's also entirely blatantly self-evident. But in the very end, it's fundamentally about saying, hey, we're just embarking on a spontaneous consumption drive here and really simply want to obtain a solid reliable reference point, a reference point where such a car registers in terms of consumption, because otherwise we would have to be here in a lab and with a what precisely is it named? The microscope and a test tube, and then perhaps the electrons and also the neutrons? Oh dear God, please just make it stop. We drove cross-country, passing right through Neubrandenburg, enjoying the scenery. Now we are leaving Neubrandenburg, and very soon we will give you a comprehensive quick update. 46 kilometers now for the total distance with 26.3 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That's dropping a bit, isn't it? Yeah, it was expected. Just like the average speed now sits at 81.5 km h. We're back in the charming scenic town of Neustrelitz on the bypass. Now it is truly time for us all to take a comprehensive stock. 66.1 kilometers, an average speed of 81.6 kilometers per hour, and a consumption of 23.7 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Yes, the first 30 kilometers at a speed of 130 kilometers per hour, those are still pulling him down. The further you would decide to drive now, I genuinely believe he might just dip below the 20 kilowatt hours mark then. In extensive country driving or in city traffic, then significantly below 20 kilowatt hours. Yes, you naturally judge, is this good, is this bad? I think it's now uh, mediocre. Mediocre because, of course, we have a structure with such a compact SUV which of course faces some resistance in the wind. So these very stylish, absolutely frameless mirrors, I really appreciate them, I must say. Yeah, chic stand out against the black, contrasting well with base color. But let's move on to the conclusion, I'd say. Yes, now it's certainly the right time to draw a very firm conclusion with the Volvo EX30. RWD one engine, single engine, or as Volvo likes to put it, a single motor. Now, with the enhanced battery pack, that is the large battery with 69 kilowatt hours gross and 64 kilowatt hours net extractable. So, I'm actually quite content and happy. I firmly believe this option would indeed be my personal choice as well. And perhaps the performance aspect, although that particular one, of course, again, takes a bit more from the bottle and is a tad more expensive. You might have to search a bit to discover where to find the most appealing, attractive offers to escape the often higher suggested retail price. The car starts at a gross list price of 37,000 euros with the standard battery, then goes up from there and of course that's already a lot of money. However, if you look at it cumulatively, by simply checking at what rate it can be leased, where I found it for as low as 259 euros per month, then it puts things into perspective and then I truly believe it's a remarkably interesting compact electric vehicle designed for all those individuals who particularly want to embrace the art of understatement yet also crave just a little bit of power who wish to drive in a somewhat sporty manner and in addition have a strong desire for a suspension that offers a fabric-like level of comfort. You've seen we were able to go really briskly across the countryside who don't just focus on consumption. It has endless charging performance, I find, with 28 minutes. That fits quite well. So, from that particular perspective, I genuinely think it's a truly sizzling hot ticket in this highly competitive compact SUV segment. I think so too. The only thing that kind of bothers me, you know, I'm just not into this whole minimalist thing, right? 
Well, yeah, I also miss, you know, right up front, well, the tarot that we're all familiar with. You have to control everything from the center, starting with the mirrors, right? Sure, good, now the window control's here on the center console, that's not really the issue now. But honestly, I don't know if I'll enjoy that in the long run. In the end, it's all about your taste and your decision, but I think one drives quite a different, pleasantly unique car here. You have this premium manufacturer of Volvo, the expertise of Geely, and then, of course, with an electric motor and battery. So I believe it's a really healthy mix, and in my opinion, there are also some snazzy colors. Snazzy interior. So I think anyone who wants a bit of a futuristic vibe is probably in good hands with a Volvo. And besides, at Geely, there's also the Smart Number 1, 3, and the Secret X on the same platform, or in the competitive environment, of course, the MG4 and the VW ID3. So it is your choice, really. We're quite eager to hear what you have to say in the comments. What's your top pick for the day? With that said, we finally reached the very end of today's engaging video presentation. Here with our consumption drive and the charging check, I hope you enjoyed the video. You rate it with a thumbs up. Please check again if you're part of the EV Pioneers community. If not, we'd appreciate your support with a subscription. Then we'll see you soon in one of the upcoming very exciting and informative videos. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and see you soon. Yours, Ollie. You, Stefan. Yes. But isn't it indeed quite great that Volvo has made the decision to completely skip the shark fin? They must have integrated it smoothly into the bodywork, all of it. Totally awesome. Into the windows and the side mirrors too. And it does look much more elegant, doesn't it? Really nice, clean lines, not with a notch sticking up like that. Well, I don't know who among you likes these half-fur-lined ones. So I would say, I'm out of this.